Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we gather in his name this morning. My brothers and I greet you. I was going to say the, the music this morning is by the Crozens. Brought to you by the Crozens. And then Melanie showed up for the last, last one. So Mary Sue, you should be proud of that legacy. What beautiful ministry. It touches my heart and my soul. And while there, the legacy of Mary Sue is, uh, is significant, the Crozen family, Brian, Marlin, and all your offspring, that's just one family of this congregation that is musically inclined and willing to share. The Lord truly has blessed this people and this part of the vineyard with that ministry. I have to believe that it is a part of the calling of this congregation as we reach not only our own, but as we reach beyond the walls to invite others to come. That this ministry of music is a part of our calling. And I praise the Lord for it. Also, I want to take a moment to thank Dave and Kathy for inviting us over last evening. The Hilltoppers met. It was good fellowship. I enjoyed it immensely. I know that others did as well. I wish you younger folks could have come, but you're not Hilltoppers. And so that's something to look forward to. When your time comes, make sure you pick up and come along. We've been called together to worship this morning, to offer up our prayers and our praise, and to be taught in the ways of the Lord. So you're invited. You've received the invitation and you're here. You're invited to lay down those worries and those cares, those things of the world that trouble you. Please, and for this next hour, lay those things down that the Lord may touch your heart. Each one of us have needs and those needs are varied and different with each individual and yet the Lord knows us individually and he knows our needs and he wants and is willing to bless you in those that you might rise up and be strong for him. So please lay down those burdens and rejoice in the Lord this hour. I have selected two scriptures for your consideration this morning. The first comes from John 4, chap uh, chapter 4. Yeah, John chapter 4, verse 25 through 27. And the hour, whoops. That's not going to be the first one. I told you an untrue. Actually, it was a mistake. It wasn't an untrue. The first scripture will come from John 16, verse 13 through 15. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you unto all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. 
All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he should take of mine and shall show it unto you. And then our the second scripture is the, actually the scripture that Aaron has challenged us with for this month. Again, from John 4, 25 through 27. And the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. For unto such hath God promised his spirit, and they who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Let us continue our worship with the singing of hymn number 13 in the purple. My God and my Redeemer, I thank you, so, Lord, so much for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with, for the gentle rains that we had last night and yesterday, and the beautiful weather this morning. I thank you, Lord, for this place that you have given us to worship, to come and praise your name. And I thank you for that, which has already happened this morning with the classes and the music that we've had to set this setting. Lord, I pray that you be with my brother Michael as he shares those thoughts and words that you've placed upon his heart and his mind, that your spirit would give him a calmness and a reassurance that you are with him. Bless this congregation as we receive these things, that we may take them to heart, and that we may always look for you, Lord, to serve you and praise you and help us help you guide us. And these things we pray in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Everyone knows that the offering is what sustains the church. And everybody, if you know your scriptures, you know when the first church started out, there was a couple that sold their property, and they decided not to tell the truth to the church, and it wasn't good for them. But brothers and sisters, Colburn Road has been blessed with not only the music, but with our youth, the Book of Mormon, the Restoration, which is in other countries, which is supported by Corbin Road, partly. Our youth ministry, the adults, it all comes from our offerings. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, bless everybody that offers today. And may the windows of heaven open up that you can bless them in all good things. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Scripture reading is from 3 Nephi, the fifth chapter. I'm going to read the last verse first and then go back and read the scripture because the last verse says, Therefore go forth unto this people and declare the words which I have spoken unto the ends of the earth. What were those words? Starting in verse 31. Behold, this is not my doctrine to stir up the hearts of men to anger against one another, but this is my doctrine, that such things should be done away. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, I will declare unto you my doctrine, and this is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine which the Father hath given unto me. And I bear record of the Father, and the Father beareth record of me. And the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father and me. And I bear record that the Father commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. And whoso believeth in me and is baptized, the same shall be saved. And they are they which shall inherit the kingdom of God. 
And whoso believeth not in me and is not baptized shall be damned. Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine. I bear record of it from the Father. And whoso believeth in me believeth in the Father also. And unto him will the Father bear record of me, for he will visit him with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And thus will the Father bear record of me. And the Holy Ghost will bear record unto him of the Father and me. For the Father and I and the Holy Ghost are one. And again I say unto you, you must repent and become as a little child and be baptized in my name, or you can in no wise receive these things. And again I say unto you, you must repent and be baptized in my name and become as a little child, or you can in no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you that this is my doctrine, and whoso buildeth upon this buildeth upon my rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. And whoso shall declare more or less than this and establish it for my doctrine, the same cometh of evil and is not built upon my rock. Therefore, go forth unto this people and declare the words which I have spoken unto the ends of the earth. Hopefully that comes on here in a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I like that. I like Dan Gard being up front with me because I can find the bass line instead of skirting all around for it for half the song. So that's... Uh, wonderful, Dan, thank you. If you and Jeff Andrew aren't nearby, then uh, I'm kind of all over the place. So, um, A number of years ago, I came across a sermon uh, by a guy named Tim Mackey. He's involved in the Bible Project, but this was not, um, not that. This was him teaching at a church in Portland, Oregon. Recently, I felt that the next time I preached, I was going to share part of this. Um, I'm not a mathematician and don't pretend to be. What I'm going to share is based on math and uh, numbers, but we're going to, it was shared by a mathematician who was a Christian, and I don't have his name and we'll forget it anyway by the end of the service, but it's pertinent, I believe, to what I want to share today. But first, I just want to read a few scriptures to get us uh, centered, and they've already been read, some of them today, but if you know the theme for this month is to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and what that means, and John preached last week on the woman in the well and Jesus' comments to her, so I won't touch much on that today, but the first scripture, I'm going to go through these kind of quick. I will pray to the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. But when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, He shall testify of me. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. We came across this scripture last week in Romans because we're talking about worshiping God 
in spirit than in truth and what that means for us. This is Romans 12, 1 through 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. The King James Version says your reasonable service. Many, many other translations have used different English words from the Hebrew, and a lot of them say worship, and this is a very conservative one, the NAS, NASB. And finally, the, the scripture that's mentioned in your bulletin this month, Alma, the Zoramites, Alma and Amulek had been there, and this is Amulek talking. The Zoramites had some issues. They didn't think they could worship God. They'd been kicked out of their churches by the rich. Um, they had been taught there wasn't a Christ coming. And so after a long speech and a long session of teaching, all, uh, Amulek sums this up and says, Now, my beloved brother, and I desire that ye should remember these things and that ye should work out your salvation with fear before God, that ye should no more deny the coming of Christ, that ye contend no more against the Holy Ghost, but that ye receive it and take upon you the name of Christ, that you humble yourselves even to the dust and worship God in whatsoever place you may be, in spirit and in truth. So I'm also not an artist, so bear with me, but there's two, uh, there's two ways of looking at a set of numbers that give them identity. And one of them, the first one, is a bounded set. This is any group of anything that has very strong characteristics and attributes and traits. And so if we have a family reunion, it's very clear who would be invited there. Who, who would show up at a family reunion? Family, right? So. You know, you're going to have grandma and grandpa and maybe their children and their children. And you fit into this group by DNA, by bloodline. It's real simple. It's really clear cut. It's very safe and nobody mistakes it. Or if you're married or a spouse of one of these, then you belong to this group. Now, I have neighbors that are really wonderful people, and they have a dog. Whenever their dog goes outside, our dog has to go out, and they run and chase each other up and down the fence line, and we talk and converse with them over the fence, and they're wonderful people, but they would not be in this group, no matter how great they are, because they're not having those identities, those traits or characteristics, right? Um, Another, another thing to say about this is that this is not, there's not a lot of borders to keep you out. It's just one thing, your bloodline, your DNA. However, that's not always the case uh, when you take something a little more complicated. I mean, this, if you're at a family reunion in the park and you just look over and you see strangers, you realize that you're, you're at Pavilion 2, not Pavilion 1, right, with, with the Barrett family. You're, you're down with the Smith family. So put the cake down. Um, the centered view of mathematics isn't based on a static number of traits or characteristics. It's based on motion. And so let's use the example how many people here play a musical instrument of some type? Raise your hands. Okay. Now, how many here would say you're a musician? A few, quite a, quite a bit less. Okay. Good. Um, so there's a lot more defining things here. What is a musician? Is it, is it somebody that gets paid to play? Is it somebody that has a formal name, True Blue, right? Is it somebody that uh, gets together once a week and practices their craft? Is it somebody that played in a rock band in college and they're just writing the legacy, you know, but haven't picked up a guitar in 30 years? There's different things based on what is a musician. It's not just 
do you know a, a C chord or do you know a C scale? It's not that cut and dry as the, the bounded set. This wouldn't really work for that. Um, the main thing here is movement. So you may be out here, like my son Weston, who started guitar just a couple years ago and takes lessons once a week or every other week and he practices at night. And he's not as good as some, but he's a lot better than when he started. He's moving towards that center of being good at your craft, a musician. And like we said, there, there may be somebody here who played a lot a long time ago, but they have not picked up their instrument in years, and they're really rusty at sight reading music, and they're moving away from the center. So, those are examples. But let's make this work with us. And here's where I've entered in a little specific thing for the sake of us. When we look at the church, we will define, if we use the bounded set, the church in a number of ways. And sometimes this can be good, sometimes it can be bad, sometimes it's cultural, but we may say that you belong to the church based on your attendance. How often are you here? Um, we may add another layer like not only are you here, but do you participate? Um, you may be here and participate, but have you filled out an application? Have you filled out a membership application? Um, you may say you belong to the church because you're the Crossing clan and your family goes here and your grandparents and everybody. You may belong to the church based on baptism. Um, you may belong to the church based on your beliefs. But then we get into some areas where this becomes more restrictive, like what's the initials in front of your church name? It's ACRB, Remnant, RLDS, Community of Christ, LDS? Or who baptized you and when were you baptized? Or who ordained you and when were you ordained? And we see that by doing this, we start to draw lines and the circle gets smaller and more and more people are out of the circle. So that's one way to look at that. And this Christian, this mathematician said he really thought Jesus would be bummed about this because this wasn't the way that Jesus operated. So using the center model based on motion. Let's say there is one true authentic church and you're a baptized member of that church. And let's say you attend church every week but when you leave church, you don't really pray a whole lot. You don't really fellowship with other believers because you're busy at work. You don't even really meditate or think much about Jesus, but you're there every Sunday. And so based on the Mondin model, you would be in here and you would be part. You would have the character traits, the identity, the attributes of being a member of the church. But based on the motion, not so much. Now, you could be here, and you could be completely involved. Or you could be someone that's had a pretty wild life. You're not baptized into any church. But something, someone has invited you to think about Jesus and you've been praying at night, and you've been feeling some leadings, 
and you begin to realize that he's real, and you want to know more about him, you, right here, could be part of the church, and you right here could not be part of the church. So let me read a scripture to you from Doctrine and Covenants 3, the 16th verse. Behold, this is my doctrine, whosoever repenteth and cometh unto me, the same is my church. Whosoever declareth more or less than this, the same is not of me, but is against me. Therefore, he is not of my church. And now behold, whosoever is of my church and endureth of my church to the end, him will I establish upon the rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. And now remember the words of him who is the life and light of the world, your Redeemer, your Lord, and your God. Amen. Um, in the past year, I've had some interesting um, friendships and acquaintances spring up because of the podcast that we do, and I want to talk about a few people today. Um, one of those people's name is, is Justin Griffin. Justin uh, wrote and directed a movie called Who, Who Killed Joseph Smith? Um, he also recently, within the last few years, picked up his family and moved his family uh, out of the city into a rural area that... He could homeschool his kids. And as he did this, he spent three months reading the Book of Mormon for 10 to 12 hours a day and studying it. Made a huge database of the scriptures. Has a wonderful class online about the doctrine of Christ. Justin was excommunicated from the LDS church because of what he believes to be true and the video that he made. If we use the bonded model, there's some of us and Justin and his family. We all believe in Jesus, so we, we make that circle. We all fit in there. We believe the Book of Mormon is the word of God. Not a problem there. What about baptism? What about thoughts on eternal life? What about repentance? We start to see that we then have walls that divide us. But what does Jesus say? Who repents and cometh unto me is my church. And so, as that family has good fruit, now only God knows the heart. I can only judge the fruit of the man and what they say, right? It's always up to God. But if you have scripture study with your children every morning and you ask them, is God shared anything with you? Is he revealing anything to you? If you post thoughts about Jesus, edifying thoughts every day on your, on your Facebook page because you have quite a following because you've made a movie and everything's focused on Jesus and repenting, are you moving towards the middle or away? Justin posted something one day and he said, I love when I'm able to have a conversation with somebody and I feel like we're teammates on the same side, that we're working together to find truth instead of trying to win an argument. Is that the fruit of someone that knows Jesus? Or do we say, well, we still have some ideas on eternity that I don't quite understand, and I really don't think that that's what God would want. And so I think your motion is still quite far away from Jesus. 
I believe from what I've seen in the communication that there's repentance and movement towards Christ, and that's my brother in the church. Last week, I was watching an interview um, online of a man who was raised LDS and kind of let, left the church for a while, was making his way back, and had come to understand that the Book of Mormon was teaches something quite different than his traditions. And he has, he's from Australia, and he has a really cool accent, so he was easy to listen to. But at the end, I thought, that was great. He's got some understanding there that I think that I've come to by reading the Book of Mormon. And he's not active in the LDS church anymore. Um, I can tell by listening and, and seeing things that he still holds on to some things, but there's movement away from tradition and towards Jesus. And oddly enough, just a couple of days ago, two days ago, I, I got a message on Facebook from this man, and he said, Michael, I love your podcast. I really helped me find my way to truth. Looking at things from a non Brighamite perspective was really amazing to me. Great work. That's, I'm not saying that to be prideful, but just because we've focused for a number of years on what does the Book of Mormon teach. It's the doctrine of the Book of Mormon that's the focus. Halfway around the world in Australia, coming to the truth. We read scriptures today about the Holy Ghost, the Father, and Jesus. One God, three manifestations, each with its work. Worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth, as we read those scriptures, is worshiping God with the presence, the life, the life-giving, abundant Holy Spirit that is guiding us. The lady at the well, the woman at the well, and the Zoramites, they looked at religion as a building, we worship in the mountain, you worship in the temple, you're of Jewish descent, you have the, the leaders and the religious leaders and the Levites, and you're the ones that do sacrifice, and you get way down here, and the Zoramites are like, we don't have any money, we're not rich, we're cast out, we don't get a stand on the tower, and it gets smaller and smaller, and they put up bounds. But Jesus says, the day is coming, and true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth, being led by the Holy Ghost, repenting, coming unto Christ. This is my church. Who declares more or less than this? The same is not on me, but against me. Let me share with you one other story. I'm going to call her Jane, because Jane, although I doubt she'd ever watch this, is still not come out to her family, that she is having doubts in the LDS church. There's real-time communication going on right now with her. My friend Shane, who's been working with me recently, Shane Robinson, um, put a video up on a Facebook page, and this lady came across that video and watched it. And it was one of our videos, and it was about the teaching in the Book of Mormon and she began to talk with Shane, and one day she asked him, do you still wear your temple garments? I'm thinking about taking mine off, but I'm really afraid. And Shane explained to her, that's not part of our culture in this branch of the restoration, but I want you to think about something. We, we look at that as idolatry, and we think how silly to think that a piece of clothing is going to save you. But to this lady and her culture and her family and generations, that was tied to the covenant she made in the temple, which grants her celestial glory in the kingdom of God. And the thought of removing that and removing that covenant and protection from God and leaving and losing everything was giving her physical anguish. She took those garments off and she walked out of her house and she said, I felt this darkness and sadness and this, this anguish and angst. And I thought I had lost everything and disappointed my Heavenly Father. And she looked up and she saw a bird fly right above her. 
And instantly the Holy Spirit brought the scripture to her mind that the Lord clothes the birds and the flowers and he knows every hair of her head and that he had her covered and there was nothing to fear. Now, as she's an active participant on one of the Facebook pages that we see often, as you step away from one thing, there's many voices calling out to you. And there's many people on this journey that are all over the place from giving up almost every doctrine they've learned and just in love with Jesus to still holding on to some of the traditions. But there's movement, right? And every now and then someone will point out and say, well, you know, Joseph Smith said this or this revelation said this. And a lot of those revelations we don't even have because we didn't count them to be the word of God. And I have this fear like, oh, please don't be led in the wrong direction. And then she comes up with this response of, well, that's not really in the word of God, and she is dialed in and having ongoing conversations about that. Is she a member of the church according to the bounded set? Some would say no, some might say yes, some might say you need to be rebaptized. But when we look at the centered set, is she moving further away from Jesus, or is she repenting? And I don't mean because she knowingly was doing something evil and vile and, and adulterous, but because unknowingly she was part of that, and the Holy Spirit is guiding her out of that, and she's responding. She's turning from repenting and coming closer to Jesus Christ. She is my sister in the Church of Christ. What does that mean for us? Rich's sermon two weeks ago talked about pressing forward. So this is a time to take inventory and ask ourselves, am I pressing forward towards Jesus? And if not, should I be? Well, there's the uh, scripture we read in, um, in our Sunday school class this morning. Every nation, kindred, tongue, people, no one escapes, has to be transformed, has to be changed on the inner man, has to be born again, has to become a son of God. Every person, no escape. Are we moving towards that process or away from that process? Because the Book of Mormon says if we have a little bit and we don't do anything with it, eventually it's all taken away. But if we've received a little bit and we're looking to receive more, we will until we have the fullness of Jesus. So when your interactions with other church members in the restoration, other Christians in the world, people that we spend our daily lives with? Are we looking at them through the viewpoint of the, the bounded example? They're a member of the church. They're not. They go to the Lutherans. They don't. They go to the Restoration. No, they're Mormon. You know. Or are we looking at them through the viewpoint? Are they relating with the Holy Ghost? Are they moving towards Jesus? Are they accepting truth? Are they on that journey of pressing forward even though they may not have completely been baptized by fire, that they have no more disposition to do evil, but they're on that path. How do we view others? And how do we view our own relationship? In my life, am I using things that are just little, well, I go to church and I'm a priest and I preach and I and I talk about God to my fellow co-workers. But in my inner, in my inner heart, that's just all show, you know. There's not real any truth behind it. Or am I really wanting to know, am I moving? Is it my inner man being changed? So how do we view others and how do we view ourselves? This was something I saw that has changed my I've never forgotten it, and it's come back to me again as I see people from all different walks of life and religion that are 
circling around the word of God and coming out of the traditions of God. We're told that we dwindle in unbelief because of the traditions of our fathers. And that's one small movement at a time until we're so far off center that we're not even resembling the church. And yet, the movement back is also that process of pressing forward. And so we in the restoration have also dwindled in unbelief, and we know this because the signs of the believers, by and large, that the scriptures promise aren't present as as a group. We've dwindled in unbelief, but we have opportunity to maybe take off the lens of this bounded set of what makes the church and what makes us righteous and what will bring us back to being righteous in his church and maybe look at the things through the viewpoint of the centered set. Worshiping God in spirit and in truth, certainly there's a lot to that, but from my viewpoint this morning, it's remembering that part of God that's the Holy Ghost that he said would guide you to all truth even the spirit of truth. This is my church. Whosoever states or preaches more or less than that is contentious, is of the devil, and those that repent and come unto Christ are his. And that's the message for this morning. God bless you. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may we repent and give to thee our heart so that we would have the discernment in these last days to see things in light and truth that Christ would have us to see. And as we draw closer to him, may we never turn the other way. So Lord, we give thanks for this hour of instruction and we pray that... um, as you guide your people home, that your angels of protection would watch over us until we meet again. And may we always be mindful of your kingdom, that which is to come upon here, upon this earth in these last days. So, Lord, may we give thee our hearts, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>